Uh, thanks, thanks, Sepp. I, I thought uh, before at Sepp thanks all of us, uh, I should tell you a story. Um, there's a very good South African. Uh, let me call him Tom Jones. <laughs> he owns a uh, this very posh lodges along the Kruger Park. Very nice, they built six, six star places. <clears throat> so uh, one of those lodges is, uh, is built in the bush and it's, the, it's, it's glass all around. So that when you sit inside, you feel like you are in the bush. It's very, very good, uh, very well designed for those purposes. If you're a tourist, you really live among the wild animals. They are walking around and you can see them. And it's built on stilts. <clears throat> the reason for that is because the, the Kruger National Park at some point decided to give concessions within the park for lodges, within the park, but on the edges. <clears throat> and they, they issue uh, leases for 25, 30 years. And one of the conditions is that at the end of your lease, you must remove your lodge and leave the bush as it was. <laughs> so that's why they built on stilts. On stilts. <clears throat> so, uh, and really this particular lodge, as I say, uh, where they have all of these chalets, just glass, and you really feel like you are in the bush. You live with the animals, next, next to the animals. So uh, he decides to invite uh, an American woman who is very senior in terms of fashion. Uh, but who also owns an architecture magazine which sells in the States a three, three million copies a month. It's not uh, for architects, but it's an architecture magazine for the casual, people casually interested in, archi in architecture. So it's very popular. So he decides, it's part of his marketing, that he's going to invite this lady to come to this particular lodge. And he'll pay for everything. So she came. And they pick her up here at, uh, in Johannesburg, take her out to the lodge. And so he says, uh, Tom Jones, to me, that the first night, they have dinner together with this lady. And at some point in the course of the dinner, he asks her, what do you think about the lodge? And she diverts discuss. discuss. She doesn't answer the question. She diverts to some other issue uh, until the end of the dinner. Following evening, same thing. What about what you think about our lodge? And the lady says, you know, the weather was so lovely today. <laughs> so it doesn't answer. Third day, same thing. Then on the fourth day of the dinner, she says, she apologizes to him. She says, you know, you've been asking me what I think about this. And I've been avoiding answering this question. And the reason for that is because I've been very angry with myself. So I had to overcome this anger, she says. Because the last time I was on the African continent was 20 years ago. <clears throat> and I came on holiday to Kenya, see the wild animals and so on. And this is the first time in 20 years that I come back to Africa. 
So we come, fly, fly from the US, landing here at Johannesburg International. It was still young smarts those days. <clears throat> so she says, I look through the window of the plane as they are coming to land. And I see a very modern city as we're coming to land. So I'm puzzled. So they land. And then she says, we come out of the airport, we drive into Johannesburg town, and the roads, the roads are excellent. Not like New York where she comes from. And New York has got potholes. But Johannesburg streets, absolutely extraordinary. So I'm again very puzzled. And then in the end, you people fetch me from Johannesburg, you bring me here. What extraordinary architecture in the middle of the African bush. She says, stunning. And then she says, you see, the reason I was angry with myself is because during these 20 years that I've not been on the continent, I have believed the stories told to me by the US press about Africa. So when I see Johannesburg from the air, this can't be Africa. Because what the press tell me is that this is jungle. Africa is just jungle. I come off, I get into these roads, better than New York roads, and then into the bush to see this extraordinary architecture. I'm angry with myself because I believed what the US press told me about Africa. It's primitive, it's backward. Those people don't even know how to wear a pair of trousers. Uh, it's wild. And then I come and I see all of this. So she, in the end she went back and wrote an extraordinary piece, uh, three quarters of which was about South Africa, not this launch. A quarter was about the launch, very good about the launch. The reason I'm telling this story is because of what Malaika and uh, Simuzondi is as Zulu said. Because what Malaika was saying, why is it that our people allow themselves to be misled? Like this lady allowed herself to be misled by the US press. <clears throat> the CEO here of the foundation was telling me as we we're coming that uh, Yesterday, he had some interaction with some young intellectuals, South African, speaking various languages, Stwana, Zulu, Tosa, Venda, this and that and the other. And they were discussing what is the word in Stwana for xenophobia. You know, it doesn't exist. Uh, in Zulu, uh -uh. so in all the African languages that were spoken by this group, they all say, no, we don't know what the word is in our African languages for xenophobia. Why? It's because it's not in the culture, it's not in the history, it's not in the whatever among Africans. Uh, and yet I'm saying, like the American lady, we've allowed somebody else to tell us that was xenophobic. And we believe it. Like if you take the, the, this most recent attacks here in Johannesburg, in Johannesburg and Egorulin, uh, It's clear these are organized by somebody. And the looters are brought to loot by bus and are taken away by bus. 
And of course, once they start looting and so on, and me, I'm in the street, I also join the looting. But it's organized, it's obvious. Uh, and yet, the narrative we're communicating is this narrative which, Amal, as Malaika was saying, will frighten Zimbabweans. We will then believe that uh, they'll get here and then get attacked and go there. I don't know how many Zimbabweans live in South Africa. Three million? How many of them get attacked? None. And yet I'm saying, we allow ourselves to be influenced by some other people who will, t who will define us, which is what Simo was raising. Why, why do we allow ourselves to be defined by somebody else, such that we lose the capacity to be the kind of change agent we want to be? Because we allow that somebody else tells us who we are, tells us what our problems are, and tells us what we need to do. And hopefully what, as both him and Malaika were saying today, <clears throat> our exposure to this learning here empowers us to say, we really need to take care of our own destiny. And to do that means to decide who we are, not to be told by somebody else who we are. And therefore act in the correct way to be the sort of change agents, the change agents that this institute is, is, is trying to make all of us to be. The, uh, uh, I think it was Dr. Paswan uh, who said, Max, uh, that she's inviting more people to join as students. I, Dr. Paswana, I think uh, the CEO of the foundation and myself were likely to join the next team of students. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. <laughs>